So to conquer diabetes, what do we do? To conquer diabetes, go for the low glycemic index foods. It's not easy. To, I mean, it's not. It's easy. I meant to say it's not hard to get a glycemic index. You can you can Google that. It's a matter of having uh, berries for breakfast instead of banana. It's a, it's as simple as having a sweet potato instead of potato. Having your whole grains, eliminating the wheat. Low GI foods. Number two, daily legumes. I met a man, he was a scientist, he was 69. He came to our retreat, he said, when I was 42 I was told I had pre-diabetes and to eat legumes every day. He said, I, I eat legumes every day and I never got diabetes. Yeah. Because the beans give that lovely, sure, steady delivery of fuel. But how do we stop them causing bloating or wind? You soak them overnight. And then you rinse them very well. And then you bring them to the boil. Have you seen all the froth that comes on? You know what that is? Wind. <laughs> you got to rinse it away. <laughs> what I do is when my beans are three quarters cooked, I rinse them again. And then I put my beans into a delicious sauce. And then you will not have that problem. They'll be a lot easier to digest. When I first married my husband 24 years ago, he could handle lima beans, he could handle red lentils, he could not handle brown lentils, and he could not handle uh, kidney beans. So what I did is at the meal I'd give him a teaspoon. That didn't cause a problem. A few days later, two teaspoons. <laughs> Within a couple of weeks, three teaspoons. He can now handle them all. So sometimes if there are some you can't handle, and they're even well soaked and rinsed, just start slowly and introduce yourself to them. As we looked at when we looked at the liver, the legumes are only a third the carbohydrate that you will find in your grains. Number three, <clears throat> there are some things that must stop. What must stop is wheat. What must stop is refined sugar. Now, if someone's, if someone's looking at conquering diabetes, initially they also need to eliminate all your healthy sugars, like your, your palm sugar, your uh, maple syrup and honey. So they need to be stopped until the blood, until the pancreas is starting to, to recover. And it can recover. One young man named Dan did our program. He was type 1 diabetes. He got diabetes after a strong course of antibiotics at the age of 15. He's now 19. He said, my, my specialist said my pancreas is dead. I said, is it gangrene? What's dead? <laughs> I said, if there is blood going through your pancreas, it's not there. The life of the flesh is in the blood. So he began to do this. Another thing is no, no wheat, no caffeine, and no, no refined sugar and no caffeine. Caffeine can actually get an insulin response, so that has to be stopped. When he came to our retreat, he ate only low glycemic foods. He had legumes every meal. He started to drink more water, hydration. And what he found was if he felt that he was getting a blood sugar level low between meals, he'd have a little bit of the salt and a glass of water and it would maintain him. I do not advise diabetics to eat every two hours because that really disrupts digestion. When we looked at the journey through the gut. Did you notice that digestion averages three and a half to four hours? So you've got to leave that break between meals. If you eat food, and this is what Dan did, and we just looked at this, high fiber. Remember what fiber does? It slowly releases the glucose. Generous proteins, there's your legumes, nuts and seeds. They're all low carbohydrates, so you're not overworking the pancreas. And also the healthy fats. We also looked earlier in the week at fats that heal, the fats that kill. And the killer fats are your altered fats. There's your deep fried foods, there's your margarines, those fats that have been changed or altered, or your polyunsaturated fats that have been extracted using high heat. They're the dangerous fats. These are the three foods that keep the food in the stomach longer. These are the ones that give that steady, consistent delivery of fuel. Also, what Dan did is he began to exercise and the exercise he implemented was the high intensity interval training. So he'd put his joggers on every morning and he would run up and down the hills. 
Now after, he was with us for four weeks. He did two weeks program and two weeks in the garden. And he came to me at the end of the third week and he said, I want to tell you something. He said, the first week, if I got a blood sugar level low in the middle of the night, I had some candies in my bag, I'd just take a candy. He said, it'd get the blood sugar level up, but he said, I'd get a terrible headache. But it got my blood sugar level up. He said, the second week, I was feeling a bit guilty that I shouldn't be doing that. So he said, if I got a blood sugar level low in the middle of the night, I'd eat an apple. It takes a long time to eat an apple in the middle of the night, doesn't it? Third week, he did something else. He said the third week, if he got a blood sugar level low, he'd jump on the floor and do 30 push-ups. So what's he doing there? Do you remember in our last presentation, looking at the heart, about the stores that we have in the cell? Remember the 20-step pathway that gives us two units of energy? There's the eight-step pathway that gives us 36. Of course, that's the oxygen pathway. But remember the little bunch of grapes, the little glycogen stores, already in your muscle cell. So when Dan did 30 push-ups, it caused a release of these glycogen stores that gave him, him energy, got the blood sugar level up. He said to me, why didn't anyone tell me about glycogen? I believe glycogen is the diabetic's best kept secret. It's already in there. And if you run out of that, what else have you got? You're fat. <laughs> That's right. He told me that one morning he got up. I have to give you Australian levels. I don't know if yours are similar. I don't think they are. So the blood sugar levels should sit at about anywhere between five and six. So he got up one morning and his blood glucose levels were three. So what he did was he had the salt, water, got dressed, had another salt, more water, went for a run, came back, tested his blood glucose levels, they were nine. And he'd had nothing to eat. Where did that come from? It came from the stores, the glycogen stores and the fat stores. If you're running out of glycogen, it's an amazing process. That's why exercise is vital. Not only that, what happens when you exercise and you're doing the high intensity? Your cells screaming out for fuel. So what happens is extra insulin receptor sites develop on the membrane around the cell so that it can take more glucose in. That's quite incredible, isn't it? Now before someone develops diabetes, they usually start with insulin resistance. You've heard of insulin resistance. <clears throat> what happens with insulin resistance? 